Academy episode 19. They didn't have all the formal schooling, but they proved they could teach. They proved they could work in the system. Now they've got to meet the minimum of the GE requirements for a general ed. So getting someone from industry who's had no college work, that's going to become extremely difficult in the future. For my job, when I left, we had four people apply. Now, part of it's the Bay Area cost of living, but two of the rest of it is, is the pay there. Uh, do I want to move to California in our case? That's a whole nother roadblock. Uh, can I meet the requirements that they've established as a minimum? So equivalency is not what it used to be, but that's where many of our staff came from. Welcome automotive aftermarketers to a Remarkable Results Radio Town Hall Academy. Listen to learn just one thing from today's episode on your journey to remarkable results. Welcome aftermarketers to the matching audio podcast of the Town Hall Academy video on where will we find our future instructors. Carm Capriato here, your host. Now, what an important topic we have for you. This repurposed podcast of the Academy Video Forum makes it easier for everyone that does not have the time to sit in front of a video screen or to be on Facebook. Now, that is the power of podcasting, the digital audio broadcasts that's so portable and easy to find. Each week, we discuss a single topic with a panel of your peers and broadcast live Fridays at 12 noon Eastern on my webinar platform and on Facebook. You can learn all about connecting at this URL, remarkableresults.biz slash townhall. See the show notes for this Town Hall Academy at RemarkableResults.biz slash A019, and there you'll find my guests' bios, the episode talking points, and other featured podcasts that each of my guests have been on. Your colleagues, well, they bring great insights in each episode. See, it's your peers who put on this tutoring and share their ideas and passion on the subject. Mostly, we're here to inspire and spread wisdom and experience for the entire automotive aftermarket. Hey, here's a cool idea. Schedule a lunch and learn with your team. Listen or watch an Academy episode together. Now, listen to Professor Scott Norman, an instructor and the program coordinator for the four-year bachelor's program in automotive technology at Pittsburgh State University in Pittsburgh, Kansas. He's also been a technical training instructor with Chrysler Corporation, and he's also chairman of the National Automotive Service Technology Committee for Skills USA. We also have Rick Escalombre, although he is a retired instructor from Skyline College in San Bruno, California. After 31 years, Rick shows no signs of slowing down and continues to teach in an adjunct role. He is also a contract trainer throughout the industry. Rick is on the Vision Educator Think Tank and can always be counted on to make some important and profound contributions to the forum. Also, Ryan Coyman, the director of training at Standard Motor Products. When he joined Standard Motor Products, he was a technician training developer. Previously, he was the lead tech drivability specialist at a 20-bay independent shop in Michigan. Currently, Ryan oversees the operations of the SMP Corporate Training Center in Irving, Texas, and oversees the operations and development of the Pro Training Group. And also with us is Tim Dwyer, an automotive education specialist at Consul Labs, a manufacturer and provider of automotive training aids. After 25 years of ownership, Tim sold his business, Super Wrench Import, in Tulsa, Oklahoma, to pursue a teaching career at Oklahoma State University Institute of Technology. There he helped start and instruct the Pro Tech Automotive Internship Program for 12 years. Now here we go with a great, great topic. Where will we find our future instructors? Hey, welcome to um, Remarkable Results Radio Town Hall Academy. It's another Friday and it's noon Eastern. We all understand you said that the automotive technician shortage exists, but do we realize the equally critical instructor shortage? And Ryan, that that had to be the reason you said we need to talk about this. Well, part of it is uh, you look at the length of careers. <laughs> I, I've tipped the scale at 40 years old now. I've got another 25 to 30 years involvement in this industry and start looking at who's a, who are the faces of the industry going to be? The four of us probably won't be around at that point. Uh, who's who's going to pick it up and take over? I mean, you've got some great guys here in this panel. Who's going to be the next Rick Escalambre, Tim Dwyer? What you're saying is as well as the uh, the technicians and shop owners are graying, so are our uh, instructors at our colleges and in our high schools. So, Tim, tell me about your feelings on that. 
I think they go hand in hand. I mean, you know, the technicians, as they grow up, sometimes they, uh, they're, maybe their bodies don't let them continue to actually turn a wrench. But I don't think, I guess, being an instructor has been advertised as, as part of this career path. So they're starting to look at it. And, and in all honesty, I think most instructors that teach automotive, you know, migrated from industry. There's very few of them that actually, you know, had a desire out of high school to go be an automotive instructor and went to college and all that sort of stuff. Um, we usually have uh, an experience base that we built up and then, you know, we decide that maybe there's more we want to do. And, 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 and I feel like teaching is given back to the industry that I made a pretty decent living at for a long time. But same thing, like I said, they go hand in hand. If there's a shortage of technicians, um, there's going to be a shortage of instructors. I mean, when we used to have a, I guess, a turnover a little bit at, at OSU and, and it was always pretty hard to find qualified people to come in and, and teach, you know, um, I was fortunate, I guess, when I helped start this program and, and, and then when I, I like to say retired from there to go work for Consulab, um, the two teachers that are teaching this program right now are former students of mine. So I feel like I've kind of replaced myself and went on. Um, doesn't always happen that way. I mean, you know, but I, but uh, as Rick said in, in his notes too, I mean, I kind of saw that in these two students and hopefully encourage them to, to look at, edu- at being an educator as part of their career path. And, and of course, they're, that's what they're doing now. They love it. I think they probably are doing a better job than me because they're closer to the age of the students. They relate to them real well, and, and they've, uh, they've still got a lot of passion. So. Thank you for that. Uh, Rick, you, you sent me some great talking points, but you, uh, you, you put a paragraph down below, and you said this. There's a saying, those that can do and those that can't, teach i know and i've heard that before and i want you to debunk that well i think at the level that we're at with technology today it has to be a balance of both because the hands-on time is just so vital to everything and the experience from the shop world the only problem the teaching world you can get away from it you've been in it too long and that's where getting outside of your own school getting a vision getting auto mechanic getting all these places getting these workshops that's where you keep your knowledge sharp, you keep your skills sharp, and you keep your industry knowledge at the highest level. Um, but yeah, you've got to have a balance of both. You just can't go in and regurgitate information. It's just not going to work, especially with today's kids where uh, visual and hands-on is just the most critical thing you can have. This is an honorable profession, right, Scott? Oh, it sure is. <laughs> I know that my students, when they say that quote that, that you said earlier, I tell them that's probably the easiest way to, to actually fill my course. And, and I'll challenge them to anything out in the shop any day of the week and, and probably be able to beat them. Um, um, I did want to talk a little bit about what, what Tim's point was about about uh, the need for um, instructors. Um, um, I teach at a four-year uh, automotive technology university, so I'll get emails all the time, as far away from California to New York, um, saying that, that that people need instructors and do we have anybody to give them? And our fear is is that is that some of these schools, maybe these small high schools around, can't find anybody to replace the retiring instructors. Mm-hmm. At that point, what happens to that program when they can't find anybody to jump in? They shut down. And so, so it's everybody's problem, not just our university or, or someone's school, but it's our whole industry because, again, if we can't find people to replace these retiring instructors, programs are going to shut down. We're not going to have as many technicians out there now, and now it's a big snowball effect, and this problem gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Are you seeing that, Rick? Are you seeing programs being shut down for that reason? Oh, yeah. In California, that's big. And if you go to a NACAT or a California Automotive Teachers Conference, you look at the gray hair or no hair in the in the the uh, at the conferences, and yet you see a really bad trend coming. Uh, there's not many in the pipeline. In our state, the CSU system does not have industrial arts anymore where instructors are coming out of it to become educators. Uh, and it's critical today because it used to be able, I could hire somebody on equivalency, someone who I groomed as a teacher, taught part-time. They didn't have all the formal schooling, but they proved they could teach. They proved they could work in the system. Now they've got to meet the minimum of the GE requirements for a general ed. So getting someone from industry who's had no college work, that's going to become extremely difficult in the future. For my job, when I left, we had four people apply. Now, part of it's the Bay Area cost of living, but two, the rest of it is, is the pay there. Uh, do I want to move to California? In our case, that's a whole nother roadblock. Uh, can I meet the requirements that they've established as a minimum? So equivalency is not what it used to be, but that's where many of our staff came from. Ryan, do you believe that the best instructors uh, come from former technicians or current technicians? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, especially in my world, 
my group of trainers are out teaching technicians every night. And so it's, it's different than teaching post-secondary or high school students. My group is teaching guys that just fixed a car <laughs> earlier in the day and they're going to go and fix a car again tomorrow. So, so in the aftermarket or, or my type of trainers, they need that hands-on experience. They have to have been there, done that to be able to come alongside that and get some authenticity and, and gain respect from the audience right away. So the credibility gap is, is minimal when you've put a former tech in front of professional techs. Absolutely. They've got the been there, done that sense. But think about it, Tim and Scott, you guys turned wrenches before you became instructors. Rick, you too. I, I guess if I was a student going to any one of your classes, I would be, you know, wow. You know, I didn't make the transition from being the, the woodshop teacher now teaching automotive. I'm a real live tech. Is this a career path for some of our technicians who we've all said the body's getting burned out? And, and, and is, is this a viable pathway? Yes, it definitely is. That's for sure. Most of our students, when they leave here, um, don't think that, that they're going to be an automotive instructor. I mean, I did not think that when I left school. And, and we used to have a, um, a, an actual instructor program uh, in our school that we actually dropped because there wasn't enough students going into it. And so we realized that our students aren't thinking that as a career path when they're going out of school. And, and really, an instructor is not an entry-level job. So when, so, when, so when the students will leave the schools, they're going to go out and try to get some experience. And so I think our job and our industry's job is that once we start getting that experience, start mentoring and start trying to find these great um, uh, leaders that are out there mentoring, uh, may, maybe the advanced technicians are, are helping mentor the, the new ones and seeing that as an opportunity to try to, try to work them into education somehow. Rick, share with us your, the 18 people you placed. Most of them were reformers day students and evening students. And the advantage of the evening students is they were the ones that were there working in the daytime, coming back at night. But if you're if you're an instructor that cares about this industry, you're always keeping your eyes open for that one or two special people that come yep. through your room. And there's a fellow in this industry, Edwin O'Faro, who was known well well known on IATN. He's now a trainer at Toyota. One night he's sitting in my class. He brought four students from the shop in Oakland two nights a week for uh, eight weeks. And I said, Edwin, you're going to teach for me someday. He says, you know, I really like to. And I, he says, my dad was a teacher in his country. I said, well, then you're going to start teaching, prepare a lesson for next week. He got 20 minutes. He got done with that. He's sweating bullets. And he says, that was the hardest thing I ever had to do. He says, it took me four hours to prepare those 20 minutes. <laughs> yeah. That's the thing that we miss when we talk about bringing people into teaching is the fact that what they have to know to prepare their classes. In a community college, you're not going to be handed a script. You're going to be told to teach a subject. Here's some help. Now go develop it and teach it with your expertise. There's no script to follow. In Ryan's world, he may he will have things laid out a little bit more for that instructor step into, but he'll also have them mentor another instructor if I'm right, so that they're not going into the class cold turkey. I had a couple of cases before I was coordinator. We saw someone brought in, and they were gone in two nights because it was well they're from industry they can teach, and two nights in service classes they were buried. They didn't come back. So that's not what we want. That's a huge leap right there is a guy might have the technical ability, but have the presentation skills. Yep. That's one of the biggest things I still uh, invest in my team of trainers is presentation skills, how to interact with the audience, how the audience has transitioned from the older generation to the millennials. How do we, how do we approach them differently here? I love what Scott was saying about uh, mentorship or, or finding the leaders of tomorrow mm -hmm. And that's one of the things that gets me out of bed every day. How can I help somebody else be better at what they want to do? And, and it's exactly that. It's finding these people that have that desire, give them the opportunity there, and give them all the tools to be the best that they can be. And I think that's huge in this industry. There are hungry young men and women out there that want to do this. We just need to take the time to invest in these people. Tim said it earlier. He talked about going to a workshop as an instructor and looking at it from two different perspectives. One the knowledge he's going to gain, but two, watching another instructor teach. And that's what it's all about. When we walk into a room, they'll say to you, why are you here? You teach us. Hey, if I learn one thing that night, but I'm there, and more importantly, I want to watch that instructor and how they present themselves. That's where you pick up the teaching stuff that's really not taught in any school. 
Yeah, I think when I first started teaching, I thought that just because I knew subject matter that everyone wanted to hear me talk about it and they don't, you know, um, there's a lot more to engaging students than just having the experience. The first uh, two years that I taught, um, I was paired up with another instructor and it was a woman and she had limited experience, but she was like six weeks away from her master's in career and technical education. So she knew the, the buzzwords that I didn't know, syllabus and all this sort of stuff that, I, that was all brand new to me. And so it, it was a good balance. But when we were, um, I think when we graduated our first class, we sat down and, and actually had a toast and talked about, uh, you know, 10 years from now, who was going to be um, I don't want to say a better teacher, but who was going to maybe have a have it easier? And she said, "You'll learn to teach. I'll never get your experience." And so, you know, uh, it was just a matter of finally stop getting in front of all the students and and just talking. I mean, you have to kind of put the uh, the the learning onus back on them and and have student driven learning. Now, all that is is more the classroom. You know, how do uh, I guess how do we attract instructors into an industry, into education. I, I guess I left in, uh, the industry and went to teach thinking it was just changing jobs, but it's a career change. The subject matter is the same, but man, the the, uh, the job description is totally different. And and I think we need to, you know, make that really apparent to people who are looking to make that change. But again, all of the, the gray and the balding and, and the age that is on this page right now, no offense, um, we need to be there, to, like Scott said, to, to mentor. How do we attract? Let's talk about that. That's one of the biggest problems I see in our industry as far as teaching, especially at the high school level or maybe the, the college level, is the money. Um, my students going out as technicians in the aftermarket industry right now will probably make more than I'm making in a year's time uh, after the first year. So when you look at that, a, a student that's going out in a, a young family and it has all the different experiences or the expenses, they're not going to be able to afford to be a, a teacher. So so what we've been looking at is maybe looking at a little bit older person, maybe somebody with a little bit of gray in them <laughs> that maybe doesn't have kids at home anymore, doesn't have a new car they have to buy and a new couch and and, and, and a new lawnmower. And, and they'd rather have more time on their hands than money. And, and maybe they're okay with taking that pay cut to go educate as long as they, hey, they realize that I, I'm maybe not working um, a, a nine to five job. I have a lot more flexibility. I could get a, a lot more time off during the summertime if maybe you're on a high school level. And so I think that you're trying to find that person who's that good fit in that, um, um, in that teaching um, environment. Why is income an issue? I mean, I hear professors make big bucks. Is it because because the automotive instructors aren't authors? They don't have PhDs. That's the problem. And, and or if it's as, as big of a problem as it is for technician pay, which is a big issue in our industry today, uh, I guess we're not going to have any more technicians. They're not going to have any more instructors. We must as well just blow up this industry, right? Well, Carm, let me say that the people that we I put into teaching, most of them, two of them, three of them we groomed for full-time jobs. They're in full-time position now. The rest of them went to aftermarket training or they're doing this as a supplemental income. And for the community college, a supplemental income is roughly $70 to $100 an hour. But when you start out, it's more like $25 an hour because you've got that prep work we talked about. But it's not a bad supplemental income for many of these guys. And if you live in the Bay Area, I mean, that's going, that's the going rate if you want to teach, you're going to teach at community college at night. What I loved about what you said, Scott, and you too, Rick, about, about what a part, part-time hourly wage would be is, can we imagine that, say, at 55 years old, the gray-haired, super professional technicians say, I want to make a change, and if they work out for, say, five to six, seven years into their, say, early 60s. Do you guys see that as a viable opportunity in post-secondary? By all means. Those guys have great experience. They've been in the shop for 20, 30 years. They're the perfect candidates to come in and teach if they have the personality. You know, they're not the grumpy old man, but, you know, they're still involved in technology. They're still involved in computers. They can relate to the students that are younger. If they could do that, those are the ones that we're looking for. So what is it that we're looking for? Give us the stereotyped instructor, guys. What's he What's he like or she like, he or she like? I think there's one point we have to address that I mentioned to you. We have to separate this from public, private, aftermarket, yeah. and manufacturing. Yeah, it is right. different. Because all four of those are completely different elements. I'll ask Ryan about, uh, about you know, corporate. I'm going to ask you guys about 
public? Well, I was at corporate for 14 years before I went to the university setting. And so the subject matter was the same, but the whole environment and, and, and then what I have to do uh, uh, as far as a public university is different. So, so my job teaching corporate, I thought, was easier. It was, it was nicer perks, new cars, new technology, new tools, new equipment. Uh, I thought that was easier um, at the university level or in any school setting you have a lot of politics you have to be involved in. You're a state employee. You're it, it's just it's just a different environment. And Rick, you came from private, right? No, no, mine mine's all public. Skyline was public, okay. Yeah, and I think the big thing there is Scott hit on hit it on the head. You know, I always said this: a full time college instructor's got to be father, mother, sister, brother, and you name it, everything, because you're in, you're involved in their whole life. Because yes. you have them, we have them 15 units, 360 hours a semester. So it's much more than just the subject. You get to know the individual, and that's a very important part, especially when it comes to recommending students to the industry. Uh, you get to you get to see every aspect of it. But the other thing, as I mentioned to you before, is teaching is 50% of the job. Scott just said the politics. The politics are wiping out teachers. They're burnt out three-quarters of the way through a semester because 50% of the job now at the most is teaching. The other 50% is non-classroom stuff. Yep. So that's another thing that's turning people away is they want to teach, but they find out that their time is limited. You're talking about admin stuff? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Scott? Uh, yeah, uh, you, know, yeah. Do you remember that, Tim? Yeah, and, and uh, that wasn't the most fun part of the teaching job. I mean, you know, we, we like what we do. We like to teach. We like to impart knowledge on other people. We like to cultivate passion. We don't want to have to document it and play the politics. And then, and then sometimes, you know, I'd even said in my talking notes that, uh, you know, there's some programs, I guess I, the benefit of what I'm doing now, I get to visit a lot of schools and I get to see a lot of programs. I see some really like top end programs and I see some struggling programs. Um, I always try and find out how well they're supported. I mean, does the teacher feel supported by a, the school and by industry too? You know, there was times when I was, doing all this work and putting things together. And, and I didn't feel like the school was supporting me. They, you know, we don't have any money or we can't do this. You're going to have to teach with a stick and a stone or something, you know, <laughs> you're going to have to make this work. And then, and then I kind of, I guess I, I would get pumped by having our advisory committee meetings because industry would come in and, and really step up. We had a great uh, advisory committee to where I really felt like I was um, appreciated, you know? And so uh, you kind of have to have a nice balance, I guess is kind of where I'm going. I released an episode this past Tuesday. It was episode 225 with a, uh, a, a young 40-year-old something. Um, and some of you can relate to that. Jose Gonzalez. And what a story. You guys, as educators, have to listen to this because he is an educator. And he started out very much like turning wrenches and then went to college. And then he went to high school. And he went to get his AAS and then his bachelor's because he's got a plan to improve the educational process of automotive technology. What a great, great story from a young man. And I'm, and I'm hearing what many of you are saying, and it re just reminded me of his episode, and, uh, and thank you for that. Uh, I, heard you, I heard you mention mentoring, uh, but I didn't hear enough about if I was an interested tech, tell me, what do I have to have in my heart to become an instructor? Passion to help people. Yeah, that's it. Passion to help other people. You know, as I said on one of my notes there too, is uh, the true instructors are in it for the outcome, not for the income. You know, that really goes with everything these guys have been saying here is, is uh, uh, you're, you're probably not going to get rich doing it, but you're going to support your family. And it, there's nothing more rewarding than seeing the light bulb come on for somebody and help them make a better living for themselves and in their family. Even I've got a stack of notes that I've gotten from people throughout the years. Uh, you know, in, in an older gentleman encouraged me to hang on to all those encouraging notes. Cause you know, there's those days where you get a little down discouraged and it's nice to look through that, but, but just notes of people that have come back to class and said, thanks for doing this. You really impacted me or, or you know, really, we really struck a note here together and uh, really made a difference in what I'm doing from day to day. So yep. it, it's stuff like that that really makes it all worthwhile. Had a kind of a fun story. I went to my 35-year high school reunion. Never been to one in my life. Didn't really have a, a great high school experience enough to really want to go, but we just had a core group of friends that said, let's go. 
Saturday night reception at the very end, one of the only instructors that showed up and they invited a lot of, you know, uh, I guess current and past instructors to come to this party was my auto and woodshop teacher. And he walked in and I was like, I can't believe you're here. And we got talking and it was cool to be able to thank him, I guess. And, 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 and so I live maybe for that, you know, one day at a party or sometimes some, some of these students will come up and say that, you know, we, they appreciate what we did for them, you know, that, that uh, whether they appreciated it at the time or not, um, you know, kind of hard to tell, but sometimes it's nice. It's kind of like your kids. You want them to, you know, to do better and to, to maybe mature and whether they do it in front of us or later is, you know, hopefully we're just a part of that. Someone asked me just a, a few weeks ago, um, how much I made. And I said, well, you know, I make careers uh, and, and, and dreams come true. And so, so I guess the biggest benefit of, of being an instructor with students is watching them grow, watching them graduate, watching them start their first career at whatever they're doing. Then they come back five years later or 10 years later and they say, hey, guess what I'm doing? I, I own my own shop. I started my own dealership. Mm -hmm. I'm now the the lead of, of whatever. And that's what I feel is the passion and the excitement is that you're getting to know those people. And, 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 and of course, Rick said that, that, that you get to spend some time to really get to know them, to, uh, to put some investment in it and then watch them grow. And I, I feel that's just great. Yeah, you're molding people uh, at an age where they need that, and they look up to you. And I was fortunate; I got them in the third year of a program. It was an engine performance and advancing performance. They were ready to graduate, but you got to look beyond. The student comes first, automotive comes second. That's been always the theory at our college. If you have the student's attention, the autom automotive will flow in. Uh, but if you think you're just going to regurgitate information to them at our level, it's not going to happen. You're going to lose them. So you got to take interest in that individual first, mm -hmm. and then you'll have that second. Uh, when I do, I do a thing. I'm doing a thing in auto mechanic. It's called this funding maker program, and it does mean basically does money make your program? The answer is no. It comes down to the individual in front of that classroom. Uh, they're the ones that make the program. You brought up a great talking point a little bit ago. Are we talking public, private, or aftermarket? Ryan pretty much handled the the aftermarket piece but what about private is private uh, paying more and is private have uh, the challenges no most of the private schools that i know of their pay is it's and is very low compared to public schools and even the aftermarket my experience we used to have we used to have sequoia wyotech in our area we have ut on our uti in our area and their pay per hour is considerably less than uh, what you would get in a community college or even in the aftermarket no matter where you go, no matter what, what it is that you want to do, you have to have the passion uh, to, to build careers and, and to uh, do knowledge transfer and to watch people grow and blossom. You know what? I, I, I had a thought on this is that, you know, when you think about teaching, you know, I could be a math teacher, but, you know, that, I, I just feel the students don't really enjoy that. Or maybe even English teacher. They're not passionate about English. No one says, you know, I really I love English, you know, but, you know, we teach automotive technology and our students have a great passion for that. You know, they draw cars, they have cars on Facebook. They love the subject matter. And I, and, and, and I feel very, very privileged to be able to have a subject matter. Number one, I love to talk about and our students love, they just love it and, and they just suck it up. Once you get out of high school, I mean, I remember my high school experience. They said, okay, if you're going to college, you need to take this, this, and this. And, and I was living the path that somebody else set for me. It wasn't very fun. But once I got into college, now, now I could choose and follow my own passions like that. It was a little better. Well, I ended up dropping out and returned to college recently. And it's a whole new world again. It's actually fun. And, and to your point, Scott, it's something you're excited about and you, you can see real life application, man, people jump all into that type of stuff. Yep. And yeah. that's what makes let, me, it. let me add to that. I think what we fell short in both conversations was we teach more applied academics than any other subject matter around. We had a career counselor day one day and uh, we set up all our labs, did alignments, showed them minutes, degrees, angles. We did dynamometer, showed them pressure, horsepower, torque, you name it, all the things that they would be learning in these so-called classes. We teach more physics, chemistry than the, the actual subjects do, and we do it in, in an applied manner. That's what we don't do enough of promoting our programs. We sell well, ourselves it, short there. Yeah, once I got into the automotive world, now all of a sudden I started learning about Knox and CO and HC and understanding a lot of that stuff that my chemistry teacher was trying to teach me years ago, but it, it had no application. Mm -hmm. and, and so to your point, 
it, it kind of brings that stuff back in again and make, makes it real. Well, you can fun. fly and move to California and you can see it and smell it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There was a big push in, uh, um, in the education, uh, especially in, in college, to flip your classroom. And what that means is that they come in the classroom and you do all these different hands-on activities and then they maybe read something outside the classroom, but they come in your classroom and they do all these hands-on activities to engage the students. And we're like, well, wait a minute, we've been doing that forever in automotive technology. That's nothing new for us. Yeah. Well, you guys are being hit with SLOs. We've been doing SLOs through NATEF and our own task list for years and much more extensive. But no one recognizes how yes. extensive our student learning ob objectives are. For a non-educator, Rick, SLO is? Oh, student learning outcomes. Yeah. In other words, you for, for courses, we have to state three objectives. For a 15-unit class, I have to state three measurable objectives they have to perform, at, perform by the end of the semester. You take our NATEF task list, you can break that down into a couple hundred. Now you're seeing the effectiveness of the student, not three generalities that uh, that you're just going to say pass, fail. Uh, we've been doing this, as Scott said. The automotive world has been evaluating students on performance for the longest time. Mm -hmm. and uh, But nobody sees it. But this is the new thing in the industry is student learning outcomes. That's one of the things that are wiping teachers out, too. You didn't sign on to be to write lesson plans. And you know, you you had mentioned something, uh, Scott. Do you have to document stuff that goes on in the classroom because you're worried about a lawsuit someday? I do know that um, you have to do a lot more paperwork. We'll say at the high school level, at the, at, the, at the community college level, it's a little bit less. At the university level, where I'm at, it's less than that. And then when you go corporate or aftermarket, it's less than that. So I I feel nice that I'm kind of at the upper level where I don't have to do as much of that. But if you're a high school teacher, you have a lot more what I'm going to call politics and paperwork than what you would have to do if you're at the university or the uh, uh, industry level. Be ready. Be ready, Scott. Student accountability is going to start hitting the whole country. If you want yeah. funding from certain um, um, funds, certain funds, you're going to have to student accountability, tracking, uh, performance, SLOs, you name it. That's all going to play into how you're going to get money in the future. It's going to it's going to hit the whole country. So, Karm, think about this, though, too. What I see as a byproduct of that is teachers that, that, that don't really, I don't want to say no better, but maybe don't understand, you know, how to engage students, whatever. They start teaching to those standards, and then it's a matter of just checking things off of a list so that they can retain their funding. Right. And just, and at the end, of, if, you get them, if you get the students walking out the door and ask them, did student learning occur, it may or may not have, it, but it was – presented and it was checked off of a list and and this was kind of mechanical i mean that's that's not really i don't know that's not how i wanted to teach i, I would rather not even put a grade on anything I, yep. I i got you know i came into teaching late enough to i don't i guess to be rebellious or, or whatever on on all that uh, technique and policy and procedure i could tell really uh, kind of just by personal observation, how well our students were getting it and who needed help and who was, who could help someone else and things like that. But then, like I said, you know, the documentation, you had to put it down somewhere because there was transcripts and records and people were paying for it and all that sort of stuff. But, you know, in, in, in my world, it'd be, there'd be no grades. We just go out there and learn and yep. I guarantee you what happened. But again, we're, we're talking to some of the best of the best here <laughs> in a guy like Tim, you, you were engaged with your students and you were, cognizant of that type of stuff i mean they're unfortunately not everybody's of that level it's great that, that you guys have agreed to come on because you know as people will watch this over and over again for years there's nothing like having the best of the best as you say ryan um walking us through the challenge and what the opportunities are if i may if i'm a 55 50 year old tech you know i'm really loving what i'm doing but i just want to change you know mid-year life you know the itch what do i do next how do i move into education so first of all, I would recommend any aftermarket uh, technician that's out there who's looking at maybe maybe trying to trying to do something like this. Number one, they need to probably get involved with their local schools, colleges, high schools, wherever, and and, and maybe sit on their advisory board because schools are always looking for for industry to help guide them and, and it help help. And so they can start doing that. They they may be able to adjunct for maybe one class. Uh, during during the evening, maybe a brakes class or maybe an engine class, something ch just to see if they want to do that. Most community colleges and 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 are and high schools are looking for, um, you know, 
the generation before me, you would you'd be able to get a teaching job just by having the experience. When I came around, they were looking for bachelor's degrees. Now, for us to hire somebody, they need a master's degree. If maybe that, that, that technician does not have a associate's degree, they should maybe want to start taking some classes. Because eventually, if they're in the education world, at least in the high school, community college, university level, they're going to need some degree. They're going to need a minimum a degree of what the student is at, if not one above that. And so that's something they can start working on right away, too. That's going to be a challenge in the future. Don't you all agree? Yes, yeah. it's a big challenge. Yeah. It's, it's definitely an issue. But one other thing, a lot of community colleges have in-service programs at night, and we're allowed to bring in pretty much anybody we want. And what I used to tell potential candidates is, come up, sit, out, sit in a class, watch an instructor teach, see what's going on. And then I have a one-page document that I give them. And it's about preparing a two-night lesson plan. It's not telling them how to do it. I ask them my, their ideas on how they would go about guiding someone's learning through two, three-hour classes, a little sample of their lecture, demonstration, a little lab, and a little sample quiz. On any subject you want, just dream. Just put it on paper. We're not here to grade you. We want to see if you have the thought process. If they don't do that, I can't take them to the next step because I got to put them in front of a classroom. We'll mentor them from there, but they've got to be able to be committed to make that first step. They can't just show up in a room, think they're going to teach, not at a community college level. Yeah. We don't have the scripts for them. Okay. So just because I may have the passion to want to do this, doesn't mean I'm going to make it. It's a big difference from wanting to do it to standing up in front of a room full of people and actually doing it. That's kind of the aha turning moment. Yep. So, so in, in my world, I recommend people, to hit the local Toastmasters club. They're still out there. A lot of people aren't aware of them, but just get get comfortable with being in front of a crowd. I, uh, I actually teach presentation skills to several different groups now. And the number one thing I say is get comfortable with being uncomfortable mm -hmm. in a lot of aspects of life. And uh, in the more you practice, you know, is look at the NBA finals going on right now. You know, Rick's cheering for the Kevin. <laughs> <Hey. laughs> But, it's, uh, but 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 those guys practice, you know, that's how they didn't just wake up one day and, and be able to swish a half court shot. These guys practice. And, and that's what we as educators need to do as well. Practice that stuff. Refine your craft there. Yep. So I, I like to have somebody that has technical abilities, but also presentation skills and crowd interactivity skills. And, uh, and so that's why I encourage people to, to work on before we throw them in front of an audience. Yeah, I think I got my uh, comfortable with un being uncomfortable by uh, when I had my shop. I was uh, uh, involved with ASA, the local chapter, and I became an officer. And then you had to run meetings and you had to do, you know, so it was kind of comfortable getting in front of your peers. And then it led into, you know, getting involved with schools and stuff like that. So, hey, Carm, think, think of this, too. There's a... Uh, this discussion has been around for a little while. A ASE a few years ago got some uh, grant money to kind of put together a entry level, I guess, pathway for uh, the transition from, you know, being a technician to a, a teacher. And if you go to their website, ASEalliance.org, there's actually a, a new instructor guide that, that, that I would encourage if, if someone is watching and interested in being an instructor, you can go look at this. And it kind of talks a little bit about everything. It talks about developing a lesson plan about uh, um, how to get content that engages students, how to manage um, a lab out in the shop area, how to manage, you know, classroom and lab activities, assessing students, and, and just all the things that we're talking about here, we kind of put together into a package that you can kind of go look at. There's a, there's videos, so it's easy to, we're not giving you a homework assignment where you have to read a lot. You can just kind of go watch videos. And that might either flick the switch on or, you know, flick the switch off on whether this is something that, that someone might be considering to do, because again, it is a career change. It's not just a walk in and start talking cars. You know, you, you have to be prepared and, and your students deserve that you're prepared. So thank you for that, Tim. ASE Alliance dot org. So uh, mentoring is a, an instructor going to have to have a mentor within the system? In most system? cases. Yeah. yeah, I think so. I think we're at a different point in time than we've ever been at, you know, and, and there's a, there's even like a, you know, a hourglass ticking right now, because if, if we don't, if we just throw these guys into the fire, like, unfortunately we probably all were thrown into the fire, um, 
the fire's going to eat them up. I think there needs to be someone there with an extinguisher to help them. And, you know, and, and I like doing that. I mean, I feel like, like I said, my passion is for helping new guys not turn and run within the first three years. I met a guy last week in Salt Lake City, a young guy that, that just got back from 11 years serving in the, in the armed forces and has taken over a high school program that's just kind of it, it hobby shopped itself almost into obsolescence. The old guy that was there moved on and this guy jumped in and he's full of passion. And I said, you know, here's my home phone or my, my cell phone. I mean, just call and cry on my shoulder if you want. I don't really care. I don't know everything, but I'd sure like to be there to, to kind of motivate you and keep you going because I, it's worth it and I want to see him succeed. On the podcast, we have a series called Educators. And I just want to encourage anyone who's listening to go to remarkableresults.biz and just on that on the homepage, you'll find a series called Educators. And all of you are on that and in that series, all of your episodes and more. So if anyone was interested, uh, listen listen to the educators talk about uh, their passion. And, you know, it's just great to hear that you guys love, love what you do. You know, what's disturbing to me is, as I've interviewed uh, people along the way that reach out, entrepreneurs, service professionals that reach out into their communities, they're saying, hey, listen, uh, the, the te- automotive technology programs are disappearing from high school. And you're all shaking your heads what are we going to do about it? Because we know we have a need, right? I think Scott said it earlier of uh, get involved with a local advisory committee. I've served on several of them here and, and don't regret a minute of the time that was spent on that. Those, those guys are usually hungry to hear from industry, as Scott said already. And uh, we need to give them ammunition, I guess, to stay relevant in the industry as well as uh, support. Whether it be financial, uh, motivational, whatever, but it's uh, but just show show the importance of that. And I know my local program here, uh, they had a habit of taking kids that they didn't know where to place anywhere else mm-hmm. and dump them into that program. And we really got that turned around because there were a lot of kids that wanted to be an automotive technician. They couldn't get into the program because it was already full of these mm-hmm. misfits, if you will. So we really steered that around, and, and of course, the the program took off once you got kids that wanted to be in that program. So, so Carm, we've and we've probably everybody on this panel has had this discussion before about um, school counselors, guidance counselors, you know, and the fact that they have a tendency of steering people toward you know four year colleges and 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 academic type of learning versus a career and technical education, and and how do how do we turn that around. That might be the, the rudder on how to change, you know, people coming into this, you know, high school programs. Uh, I, I think this is my opinion. I think that basically we're trying to do too much too fast. I think the industry has neglected bringing people in for a little while here. Now there's a, there's a lull in the action. There's a pocket of, of uh, um, a lack of technicians and we're trying to make up for it by trying to train them too fast. I think we needed it. We have needed to have started a lot earlier, seventh and eighth grade on, on giving, you know, like, um, like Ryan said, you know, some application to some of the things they were studying to cultivate a passion in hands on learning and, and grab it at the high school level. Automotive is expensive to teach. And some high schools, you know, they see that and they either can't afford it or they, they cut a corner and they, they kind of teach automotive, but they really don't. Um, but I don't think, you know, until they get out of high school, we should really worry about it. I think it's just kind of a discovery phase. I think we should be showing them all the stuff that's out there, whether it's, you know, culinary or bookkeeping or whatever. I don't really care. We need to, to, to cultivate you know, their passion. And then after they leave high school, you know, continue on to a college and, and, and perhaps a shop and internship, however it goes. But, you know, I think guidance counselors were a, a key in maybe misdirecting, you know, students into our program. And so how do we as a, as an entity, could it, it could be ASA, it could be, you know, uh, IATN, it could be anybody go to college, I mean, to uh, high school guidance counselors as a, as a, force to be reckoned with and say, you know, here's, here's what we have opportunity wise in our industry. And you need to be aware of that. And you need to start looking for those people and planting them where they bloom instead of forcing them into the stuff they don't want to do. Tim, thanks for saying that. I've talked about with, you know, 200 and some episodes, two, two plus years doing this. And this always comes up and we, I always say, get out there and go see your guidance counselors. And you just made me rethink that. (laughs) Don't go see them. Invite him to your place. Yep, that's exactly what you do. Yeah. yeah. I want to come and talk to you about, you know, a career 
moving people into a tech, technical career in automotive technology. No, I pay taxes in this town. Come and see me. <laughs> Carm, I'll give you an example of that from the student aspect of it. Every spring, we would bring in 125 to 150 of the local high school kids, bring them to our facility, bring them to a college-level facility to see what we have, see what they'd be involved in, give them a barbecue, have our students speak to them. Never in their environment. You bring them to your environment. The problem with the career counselors is, again, follow the dollars, where the dollars are going. You'll see where they're being directed. But the trickle-down effect is affecting the whole industry because the kids are coming to the community colleges at a much lower level than they've ever had, we've ever had before, and getting them up to speed has taken much longer. So they're leaving sometimes at a lower level than they used to. So the whole industry is being impacted by this. I say this, I wouldn't be sitting here today if it wasn't for sheet metal in the seventh grade and junior high. There's a romance from many of the techs that are working today with automobiles because it was easy to get and have. And, you know, my first car was a 65 Mustang and my God, and I fixed it up and, you know, I crashed. And then I, th there's so much um, historical love reminiscing that has to be, people became automotive people because they hung around vehicles that they could actually do something with, right? Yeah, you grew up around service stations too. And you cut your teeth there, they're gone. Out here, they're gone. Yeah, now they know tires, rims, lowering their car, and a sound system. Hey, come in, take a nice ride. You should see with my beautiful center stack. Come in my new 2017 Malibu. It's really cool. I have Wi-Fi. <laughs> so how are they going to know that they like working with their hands unless they're allowed to work with their hands? I yeah. mean, at, a, at an early yeah. age. Sheet metal, metals, wood. That was that was high. That was yeah. junior high. That's where you found out that you could do these. That's my that's my fifth grade son currently. You know, his teacher is frustrated and banging his head against the wall with this kid is brilliant, but he's just not applying himself in class. He's checked out with his stuff and in the, again they're trying to fit him into the educational mold. Yep. Also we got him a bandsaw and a drill press and all that kind of stuff for Christmas. You know, the kids adding up fractions by using a tape measure or, yeah. or a square and all this stuff. And the kid's building amazing stuff. He helped me put a lift on the Jeep last weekend. You just got to find that right element and give people opportunities. We all aren't going to fit into the box. Yeah. I still say many of our incarcerated people are people who just became very disinterested in school and us not having this available. I'm going to give you an example. We were with the Toyota program. We used to get cutaways, beautiful cutaways. They were made by people in Montana State Prison. So you put the you put the links together and figure out what the skills were. But the point being here is sometimes it's just the student being disinterested. And you can probably follow the dropout rate with the dropout uh, with the drop in CTE programs. I am overwhelmed by this discussion. It went places I didn't expect it to go. Thank you for that. Um, you brought your knowledge and you served it up wonderfully. Uh, I want to go around the room quick. Give me a you know a one and a half to two minute uh, overview of uh, of what our discussion was about. Uh, how to encourage finding our future technicians in our industry, be it private, be it aftermarket or public. And uh, I want to thank you right now, um, Scott and Ryan and Tim and and Rick for being here. So let's start with Scott. Well, I would say for 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 those guys out there. Who are thinking about being uh, an educator? Uh, if you wanted to come work for me, let's say at my university as an automotive instructor, the ideal candidate would be someone that has some good hands-on experience at, at a shop. You know, five to ten years plus would be great. Also, having education experience, so teaching experience, and so so uh, I'm I'm very uh, wary about hiring somebody out of a shop who has never taught before. So try to get that ex ex teaching experience, no matter what it is. Maybe with the Boy Scouts, uh, doing something else with coaching, uh, but 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 whatever it is, some type of teaching experience. Also, with the new requirements with the Higher Learning Commission, uh, you're going to at least have to have a bachelor's degree. So, so if you have the associate's degree, try to work on maybe a few classes at night. Try to work on that bachelor's degree because that will definitely put you above everybody else out there who doesn't have one. Thanks so much, Rick. Well, I'll give it to you from the community college aspect or public. Is One, as an instructor, always put the student first. Look at those individuals. And you as an instructor have the skills to pick out that leader who can guide someone's education, even in, a, even in their starting stages. You watch that individual, walk, watch how their friends react to them. That's where you find your gold mines. And with your aftermarket people, have a plan in place. So when they come to you, say, 
this is what I need you to do to get started. In California, they can get in with an AS degree uh, if they want to be full-time adjunct. They come in and we can get them signed in with their work experience equivalency. Uh, but they've got to be mentored. They've got to be given a, a basic plan to work from because you put them in the front of the students the first time, you're going to lose them if you don't prepare them properly. But it's a wonderful career. It's a way to enrich people's lives. And after 31 years when I left, I left and I still loved it. And same day, same as I did the first day I arrived. And if you can keep that passion in you, you can really change people's lives. Where did the word adjunct come from? Because, you know, it just means part-time. Is it just a fancy, you know, uh, scholarly name for part-timer? <laughs> they don't owe you any benefits. They don't. They pay you differently per hour. <laughs> ah, I see. Okay. It's a scholarly uh, moniker that says, you. <laughs> I got it. And I had to say the word, ad- I had to explain what adjunct means because so many people are going to listen to this and say, uh, what's that mean? So, part-time. <laughs> Thank you. Ryan. One thing I look for as an aftermarket training entity is, is first off, the passion to help people. You got to have that drive. Second, the technical experience. Third, the, the presentation skills. As I mentioned, get ramped up, whether it be the Boy Scouts, a local church group. I started out teaching local, local classes in the upstairs of my shop just, just to get some experience myself. But then there's also the travel aspect in, in my arena. Quite often I get guys saying, you know, someday when I retire, I'm going to come work for you or give you my application. That's fantastic. We, we love that experience. However, most of my guys travel 150 nights a year. And so that, that wears on people. So you, you do have to have the passion for travel. I love to travel. I love seeing people, new experiences, et cetera, taking my family to a lot of opportunities. And so that's a big part of the aftermarket training world here as well. So uh, you have to have all those three pieces and, you know, fortunately we, we keep finding the right individuals, but, um, they're out there. It's a rewarding job for the right person. Any openings? Mm-hmm. We're always adding to fortunately we're, we're, uh, adding another couple hundred classes next year. So I'm uh, looking for another three instructors. Mm, inside track, everyone. Oh, by the way, just before I, I go to Tim, uh, I actually sent my resume to the local community college to join their advisory board. I had done a done a gig with them for about ten years back in the in the nineties, and uh, knowing that I you've all encouraged me to do it and that I should and I must, I'm waiting. Well, I think as somebody said earlier, just to quick jump in different phases of different people's lives. I think Scott said it, you know, a younger person has a growing family and no time to do it. When you get a little bit older, maybe an empty nester. I've served on school board it was tough with my family schedule, but we appreciate a lot more of the grandfathers coming back in, in dedicating their time as well. There's a wisdom that you just can't find or pay for that exists in people that have no hair or gray hair. Right, Rick? That's absolutely it. I'll give you the last word, Tim. After uh, owning a shop for 25 years, I thought I would have been buried in it. I never had any desire to do anything other than what I was doing. And eventually just kind of got very interested in education. I always needed to uh, needed help in my shop and, and growing my own um, was a, a, turned into another profession, so to speak. So never say never, you know, um, uh, take a look at the opportunity of teaching. Um, uh, like I said, it's a different time in life right now. And I think that there's a huge, there's going to be a huge support group that will help you, um, make that career change if that's what you want to do. Um, uh, is it in place right now? No. Um, it's getting there. It's going to have to be there. And, and, uh, everyone I'd say on this panel is willing to, you know, to, to guide anyone who's interested in making this change, but, uh, come on in. The water's fine. Carm. Give you one good example. Go to Auto Mechanica, go to Vision, and look at the people who are doing the training there. Uh, there's not a lot of new young blood in that training group. And that's a trend of what's going on. Um, we've got to change that. That's true. Great point. Gentlemen, thank you so much for your time. Thanks for being on the Academy. Thank you, Carm. Hey, thanks for doing thanks. this. Thanks for being on board to listen and learn from the premier automotive aftermarket podcast. Until next time.